And thanks to uh, everyone for inviting me out here. I'm really pleased to be here. A as a starting point, I'm not really a barcoder, as most of you know. But I'm quite interested in it. We've tried to certainly enable some of it in Australia. And I think if you, if we, if we are really all step back and think about a big vision for what we're trying to do, the fact is what we should all be trying to do is really understand nature in a time frame that allows us to have an informed response to humans' impact on the planet. And if you set that as a big vision, it's really what we need to do, then everybody's contributing. You know, we're all doing our own bit to go there, and we shouldn't be saying this is better than the other. We should think of ways that we integrate all this information to really make that informed response even more informed. And I think this is what I'm going to talk about with examples from the Atlas about uh, how we're trying to do that. So actually, I'm starting with a slide. This is from Craig Moritz. It's one I, I, what I borrowed off of Craig, uh, one of my colleagues in Australia, who many of you will know. And he started thinking about what would this, well, he's called it a museum. Perhaps maybe it would be better to call it the, the Biodiversity Analysis Lab of the Future look like. It's a virtual environment. It's supported by biodiversity informatics. But it, it, it links the genome and the phenome together. It's bringing in both types of information. It's, it's got environmental layers to, to help us understand things. It's got a phylogenetic background. And then because it's got all of these, then it's help, helping us answer these questions over here on the left. So I've kind of tried to parse out a little bit the different bits. And then going through the talk, I'll try and talk about are we solving or getting to these bits and what parts do we need. And, and just saying. I mean, Craig knows this very well. It should go without saying, but for people who do need it said, look, taxonomy is one of these bits. We need a good, solid name framework uh, and a classification of whether it's a Linnaean name, whether it's a bin, whether it's some kind of persistent o OTU or LSID. I think it'll be a combination of all of them at some point, but we need to have that in there in a, in a uniform and persistent manner. So talking about the atlas now, which is something I love to do, but you know, I really, quite frankly, I'm only going to have time to skin the surface of what the Atlas does. It's an amazing thing. We've got an amazing team, and we've had a great deal of investment. You can see we've had quite a bit of government, direct government investment. What this means is that you can leverage this. Everything we've done is open source, open access, open infrastructure. So that means that you can take, we, you can download it. People are using it. They, you know, we don't charge anything for it. That's part of the, the, the mentality, I think, that you have to get to. And we're about data. One of our key indicators, especially when we report back to government, it's about data reuse. Are people using it? So right now, we're delivering about 56 million records from 1,000 data sets. As of a couple days ago, there have been over 6 billion records downloaded from the Atlas by people to support research, education, uh, biosecurity, conservation. People are using the data over and over and over again, and that means we're, we're on a winner. The other thing that's, because it's open infrastructure and we deliver what we do through APIs and web services, I don't even know what half this stuff means. I'm a, I'm a biologist in the background, but my guys tell me I have to say this stuff. But, but we deliver this through the way we deliver it means that we're actually building our front end on top of these services, but other people can too. And, and we're continually coming across people we've never even heard of that are using the Atlas to, to do things, support things, build games for kids. It's, it's really quite cool. And, and in fact, we're now at the point working with GBIF and, and Donald and his group that we're, people are able to download almost the entire Atlas infrastructure to support uh, biodiversity, a national biodiversity lab in their country. So Spain's got one, France has got one. I believe while I've been away, we've signed the paperwork with Scotland. So Scotland will have one soon. Uh, my understanding is there's nothing but nematodes up there, so they don't need, they only need a small section of it. But we, we can move this thing around. And, and, and why would you pay for something if someone's already built it? Like we don't have the resources. We're, oh, we're jammed here, sorry. I forgot these links were live. So, ah, good. Right, so the Atlas does three main things. It, it does lots of things. I'm going to talk about the three main ones. The first is it gives you information about species. 
The second is it, it, you can look at an area and find out what lives there and start asking questions about things that live in a given area. And the third is it supplies some pretty cool mapping analysis visualization tools that let you get in and, and have a closer look at the data. So starting with, with a species page, this is what an atlas species page looks like. This is what are the local bird, this actually the, 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 whatever you call it, the bird of the ACT, uh, the gang gang cockatoo, they're quite beautiful. And every species in Australia has a page like this. Some of them don't have any pictures or records, but everything's got a page. Uh, and it will tell you this has got, it, it, if it has an endangered status in any of the states or anything, or it's vulnerable, it will tell you this. It's got all the records here on the heat map. If there's sounds, you can click on them. Down below, if you were to scroll down, there are links to other web information about it. I think we have over 100. We've got about 100 pictures and videos of this thing, names, classification. There's over 55,000 records for this species. And you can download them and play with them, take them with you. Uh, literature, I think we've got links out to about 35 sequences now. I was checking it this morning. And if I see one in my garden, I go, oh, that's cool. I could come in and actually record a sighting in the atlas. So I could just put it in, and that becomes part of the atlas data set. In terms of looking at regions, we can start playing by location. So here, uh, I think there's, we have 14 different ways of putting an area on a map. But once you do it, any way you do it, you, you can pull back uh, area reports or information from that area and, and start playing with it. So this is a very simple one. You just put a dot on the map. You can put your address in or whatever. This is very close to Atlas headquarters in, in Canberra. And you throw that on, it gives you a five kilometer radius. You can change it to 10 kilometer and it tells you all the species that are in that dot. In this case, there's over 6,700 species. And now you can start filtering it. You could look at just the 36 reptile species that are there. You could even filter down and look at just the 87 records for Eastern brown snake. Uh, this is a nice little example here because this is the second deadliest snake in the world and it's scattered all over Canberra and everywhere we go to work. And you can look, this individual record right here is actually one that my, my cat dragged live into our house one evening. And it, you know, a bit of an adrenaline moment, you know, step one, separate cat from snake. Step two, separate snake from house. Step three, put the record in the atlas so we have a persistent record of life in Australia. You know? uh, but then, oh, sorry, you, you can come back now to all species. And, you can view all the records and actually go to the records. There's over 650,000 individual records in that area, and we've got filters down the side here. Right? Yeah, they show up well enough, but you can start filtering it. You can, you can look at just the orchids. You can look at just the things collected in the last uh, decade. You could look at, you could, you could do a little, run a little visualization to see how things change during the months of the year and watch migratory species move up and down. I'll, I'll just pick one here to, to kind of, show you is I'm going to pick endangered species. I'm going to pick the common names on those. And really, it doesn't take that much longer than that. And you can get a list of uh, endangered species right near where you live. And you can see the value of this for environmental reporting, planning, uh, conservation, things like that. We, we have, like I say, lots of ways. You can, we've got a lot of predefined regions, states and territories, biogeographic regions. We have the indigenous protected areas in here. We have Marine regions, any one of these, once you click on this region, this is where the barrier reef is. Again, almost half a million records, almost 15,000 species. Any, anywhere you go, you can come in and start getting information. So now we can kind of come to, to mapping and analysis. So, and this is where you start bringing in some environmental layers. It doesn't have to be environmental layers. You could do other ways of filtering data. This, for example, I've pulled in all the records for the genus Decelo or Decelo or however you bird people would pronounce it, but it's the kookaburras. And I've pulled them all in, and then I've said, okay, filter these, filter these records on species, and you can see how the two species of kookaburra, their distributions lay out in Australia. Very quick way of visualizing that thing. This is one where I've gone into, uh, this is, this boundary is Kakadu National Park. Uh, lovely. If, if, for people who know nothing more about Australia than, than they've learned from watching uh, Crocodile Dundee movies, that was actually filmed up in around Jabiru here. It, but, but anyway, so now you know where that was. But what I've done in this case is I've pulled out all the endangered species in, in uh, Kakadu. I've kind of filtered them by species. And if I go in and click any one of them, like this rock boa, I've clicked that right there. 
and it comes up and it puts these little red circles around all the rock boa dots. So it's a very quick way of looking at these and, and seeing what, what lives there. But now we can bring environmental layers in and start having a play with it. So at this one, what I've done is I've taken all the records of koala, slapped them on the map, and then I've done a, a Maxant. We've got predictive analysis, and I've just basically plotted current distribution against predicted 2030 climate layers. And well, look at this. A lot of the dots on this map are going to be in pretty marginal areas in the not too distant future. So it's a tool that will help you understand potential for, for effective climate change on diversity. Th this is a, a something called a scatter plot. And what we've done, these are all your, your uh, <coughs> distributional points, all these dupe, uh, blue points. And because for we've got over 400 layers in the atlas, climate, uh, soil type, elevation, whatever. At any given dot on this, uh, on this map, we know the value for each of those layers. So you can now sit here and you can plot all those dots in environmental space. Here I've plotted it as rainfall versus temperature and it falls out like this. These are the low, low rainfall, high temperature. I put that little box right there. And because I put that box there, those red, those red uh, circles pitch up on the map. And you can see these are the ones that live in low rainfall, high temperature zones. It gives you an idea to start thinking about how climatic factors affect the atlas, or affect things. And you can even start dropping, uh, this, these are your, some of your uh, terrestrial vegetation layers. So here I've just dropped on the alpine meadows uh, in the snowy mountains. So you can take those alpine meadows, drop them out, treat it as an area, and get an area report for that that'll give you the list of species there. It'll tell you if any species are endemic. You can, you can look for endangered species. Lots of ways to play with data in this. So we're starting to get to where we've got some of these boxes ticked off here. You know, the, the idea of names and distribution and environment. Now, if we really want to understand some of the process that leads to the pattern, we've got to come in and start looking at phylogeny now. We've developed something called PhyloLink. It's been through a couple of uh, development sprints recently and is back out with the community for testing and playing with. What this does, it does not create trees on the fly. It doesn't create create trees from your data, but it allows you to import trees, import characters that import data, and then link to the, all the tools in the Atlas environment that, that let you do fun things with it. So go in, in this case, I've pulled in an acacia tree. This is uh, Joe Miller, he's put in an acacia tree. And because this now links back, well, hopefully these names will match up to the Atlas names, and then you could do something like click on this terminal, and you'll go straight to the Atlas species page or you can click on, uh, on this given clade here, and it'll go to those names, look up the distribution records for all those names, and plot them out on the map right there under different colors. So you can start seeing how the different species of this clade plot out during, in, in, uh, in Australia there. You can also start putting characters on the map. I've put some, uh, or on the, clay, uh, on the tree, I've put four characters here. You can see they start to light up. You can click any given uh, terminal and you'll get the character states with it. And you can start doing things like you can plot the character to abundance. So in this case, uh, in fluorescent arrangement, you can see they're mostly, uh, what is it, mostly paniculate, but one, no, mostly racemos and one paniculate down here. But you can plot out this, this uh, character in fluorescence color has a bit more variation in this clade. But there are things that you can do and you can even now take these things and map the characters on the map so that you might go back and look, at, look for characters that are actually show some phylogenetic signal as they map out, or not more of an environmental signal than a, a phylogenetic signal. Uh, and, and you see how they're responding to, to, to climatic factors. Uh, another way to come and do this is you could get these profiles. So I am now going to look at the precipitation for you know, the rainfall for all of these things, and if I pick this clayed up here and just click on that rainfall, you'll see that, you know, it's fairly widespread across a lot of uh, rainfall zones. But if I click down to this one, you'll see it, it's all of a sudden starting to look like more of a dry area specialist. So you can start looking to see there's a, a, a project that someone's doing right uh, down in Oz right now, looking at salinity. And what they're seeing is that within, within the cladogram, salinity isn't actually something that's got a lot of phylogenetic signal. It hasn't uh, evolved once. It would, it's fairly widespread 
all across the tree and fairly plastic. So it's the kind of things you could start play with to understand. And just phylogenetic diversity, just because it looks cool. So we're starting to bring phylogeny in. Uh, I want to come up to museums. Uh, uh, you know, we're kind of keen on the idea of creating, like other people. You know, I, none of these ideas are really unique to us, you know, but we're just doing them. But uh, we, we'd like to create a virtual natural history museum at some point for Australia. There's about 60 million specimens in Australia, two to three billion worldwide. Wouldn't it be nice to not only have an environment where you could go in and look at any of those specimens, but actually have tools that change the way people taxon uh, or collection people do taxonomy and museum type of research is done. W one of these, for example, is we're working on an e-flora. Again, this has just gone through a couple of development sprints. Uh, it, it's kind of a bit of a hybrid now, so it's pulling live information in in terms of records, in terms of images, things like this. At some point, I would hope to see it, get it where it's actually generating the profile descriptions live from character matrices under it. We're not anywhere near that yet. The community doesn't want it yet. What we're doing now is these, this profile information is you give permission to a few experts who can come in and play with it. But it's still, it's, it's, it's moving some of this off of a C drive, which is actually a huge step forward. So that's, that, you know, little steps. We're getting there, you know. It's a, it's a very important thing. And again, it's, it's bringing publication dynamic, persistent, continually updated and accessible. It's, it's a neat step. But we're also interested in, in, in creating the, bringing the specimens online. So this, if, if we could actually click here up at the top and you could look at all the specimens in all the collections in Australia, you could do it by collection. This is South Australian uh, invertebrates. You could see lots of beetles. You could start sorting. You could sort by, by order here. You can sort by types. You can look at just the beetle holotypes. Yeah, you know, I have to apologize. There, there, there are only really two sexes in, in beetles. There, there aren't that many categories. That's actually an artifact of the way people label uh, specimens and having to come back from that. That will get cleaned up in time. You know, this is very, very early days here. But it, it's the kind of thing you can do, and you can pick these up. You can imagine not only for taxonomic interest, if you're a quarantine worker who's got some nasty fruit fly they want to look at, well, here are some pictures of Australian fruit flies. You can come in and zoom through them have a look. And we're also into whole drawer imaging, the idea that, well, you know, you just can't go into the Australian in National Insect Collection and image every one of those 10 million specimens in a meaningful time frame. But we can take whole drawer images. We can uh, make actually pretty high quality ones, which means you can put them kind of like with Google Map and you can come in and start playing with them and zoom in on them and actually get pretty close to them. And you could, you know, at this point start looking at characters or here's a group of flies and you could come in from anywhere in the world and have a look at a holotype so that you can actually come in, have a look, and maybe that really keeps you from having to borrow a specimen. And yeah, look, I hate to admit it, but we do have non-insects in, in the atlas. So we, we actually do have quite a few really nice images from other collections around Australia, and, and, and they're very nice. So again, museums, environment, phylogeny, we, we, we've got to come back to morphological information here now. Uh, it's nice to have pictures of stuff online. But look, that's, to me, that's the starting point. Because until you can use those image libraries, to extract information from them, and then store that information in a way that's, that you can store it, you can share it, and you can allow people to reuse it for whatever they want, you're, you're, you're falling short of the task. Uh, so, and, and we need to, we, we don't have them yet. It's an area where we have to go to have these trait banks that, that you can populate off the specimens. Why is morphology still relevant? Well, look, it is still the primary way in which people gather and assimilate information. And in the same way that, as, as a guy that's basically a, a comparative morphologist at heart, I would never dream of anymore doing systematics without including genetic data. One shouldn't imagine a world where we're just using genetic data without other information. It, we've got to integrate it all. So just some of the tools we can do, for example, here's a little measuring thing that we've got that once you calibrate, you can come in and you can see we could just draw a line and it gives us a 
it gives us a measurement. So we know, hey, this is how long it is. We take that off an image in, in the collection. We still have to store that by hand. It's not automated yet, but never mind. It's an idea of where we're going, and th that you can take these whole drawer images and segment them out, create su sub images from them, so that at some point you're going to be able to go in, sub image them all, start gathering data from them. Uh, this is just another way of, we'll see if this is all going to work now. We're, 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 we're testing the technology now. Yeah. So we'll go back here. Just some idea that we are now putting, uh, yeah, I know, pretty cool, huh? <laughs> but but, but we're, we're putting uh, 3D images on, on the, uh, up and making them available. And, sorry, okay, I'll, I'll go fast. The, the trick isn't create, well, actually, there is a trick in creating the 3D images. The trick is going to get information out of them and, and, and not and, and make it available to people. So this is an example of a website that people have built where you can drag the images in and actually start doing measurements, storing annotations, storing those measurements, marking up body parts, whatever you want to do, adding pictures to it so that you could actually at some point hand an iPad to a quarantine worker. This, this bug here is actually a major quarantine pass and say, have a look, spin it around. This is what you have to see. Look at this image. This is what we're going. But we still need this huge order of magnitude increase in how we capture image from image libraries. Uh, this is what I really feel. We need to match the omics explosion with morphological information. And, 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 and so I'm going to go back to the idea that we can now, here's a, some, take a picture of dragonfly wings, drag them onto the website, the same guys that created the 3D website, and see what we can do in terms of analyzing them. So I'm going to go to here, so I've dragged a dragonfly here, or a damselfly as it is. Those are what the wings look like, and now this is live. Uh, it's gonna take a second, but we're now having computer vision, some image-based phenomics algorithms analyzing this image. And what we're trying to do is we've given it, well, we're using dragonfly images because they're big for insects. Wings are big, feature-rich, uh, 2D, we're going to go 3D, but you know, you, you walk before you can run, and we, we can segment out the background. So this is a very easy starting point, but it points to the future. And we've given it different classes of characters. So we've asked it to uh, look at present absent character. So it's this little terra stigma here in the wing abs absent or present. Do some meristic characters, actually count some cross veins in cells, and then compare the, the boundary shapes of it's taking a little second here, but it will get there. But compare the boundary shapes of these wings. While we're waiting for this one, I'll show you one that we already did. Uh, looks like this. This one should come good in a second. Th this isn't going quite as well as it should. It's, in practice, it was doing better. But anyway, what this does, it's, it's, we'll, we'll go back to this while we're waiting. It will give you something that looks like this. And the neat thing is, is once you get this, and it comes and does all these counts, you can export it into a CSV file, and it actually drops, it extracts characters automatically, drops them into a, a character matrix that you can play with and do things. Is this one done yet? Yes, this one is done now, so it actually did work. This is the first time anyone's seen this in action outside of the lab, so you're the first, and it's picked out that these things are present, and again, downloaded these characters. So I better hurry up now. Just showing you that. And again, we want to turn this into this and make that available to people. So we've got pretty much everything now, except genome, which is probably what you expect me to talk about. But we're not going <laughs> to, my talk. <laughs> we, we, we actually aren't going to handle genomic information ourselves. We, we should not, oh. Species interactions, I just need to point out, especially after the lovely talks yesterday, it's, a, it's, it's an area that's blank for us. We need to, to pick it up. We don't do species interactions yet. We know we have to go there. It's, it's on the list. But we don't want to manage genomics data, set standards for it, store it, do the informatics. That's not our job. Get experts to do what they're expert at. However, once that's done, we want to link into it for discovery, integration, and it may be, looking at some of the, the, the trees that Rod just showed, 
and others. It may be that we don't even need to do that. We just need to look at the results of an analysis and drag a, a molecular phylogeny into the atlas in the same way and, and play phylo link rather than try and handle it. But we do need to integrate the data at some point. So we're not there yet. We got a ways to go, but we're starting to get an idea of what this might look like in the future and where we're heading and some of the tools that are going to help accelerate it. I just want to come back and, and finish with a couple of things and then I'll get off. Look, we're not going to do this ourselves. We have no intention. There's a lot of really cool global initiatives going around right now. Uh, fantastic people, really involved. We can't have a future where we've got all these data silos doing things and not talking to each other. The future that's really going to help us achieve our goals in the right time frame is us coming together and, and somehow figuring how we're going to combine this stuff and bring it all and make it happen. Uh, final words on the Atlas. Basically, a reminder that it is open infrastructure. Take advantage of it. And just point out that I've just skimmed the surface. There are so many cool things that we're doing that I didn't talk about today, things that we're doing now, areas that we're going into. And we have such a fantastic team. So just keep, keep checking this site out. It's going to get better. And thank you very much. <laughs>